Hello, good evening, and welcome to Bangalore International Center. BIC is an inclusive and neutral platform for informed conversation, intellectual dialogue, exchange of ideas, arts, and culture. Today's program is biodiversity, climate change, and you, the need for immediate action. All of us are feeling the impact of climate change, and unless we all unite to take immediate steps, the Earth could soon face drastic calamities. It is vital that we understand and protect our biodiversity. The days of economic development versus environmental protection are over. The pandemic demonstrated that. We now need to innovate and rethink ways to simultaneously improve both our economic and ecological security. Ladies and gentlemen, Bitu Segal. Thank you very much. In a sense, this evening, anything that we speak about would be something that Ramki would speak about, or any one of the so many people, including the people in this hall. We're going through a very strange time, and we have the evening ahead of us to interact. I wouldn't like this to be some kind of a big gyan delivery session. I'd like it to be interactive to the extent that uh, not just questions, but views, very welcome. But to set the tone for this, I mean, climate change and and you and me and even the young kids and even the elder generation. This film that you're going to see over here is a short film, four or five minutes. We put it up almost a decade ago. And before we knew what had happened, we had six million views. Some of these were from Russia, some of these were from China, some of these were from America, some of these were from Europe, and we didn't know. We had no idea, we never promoted it, we never did anything, we just put it up. So may I just ask for that film to be played that sets the tone for the evening.
anyone who says that uh, protecting the biosphere or wildlife or the tiger or the elephant or anything is not a life and death matter, doesn't know what he's talking about or she's talking about. The fact is it's always been dangerous. It's even more dangerous now as resources run out, awareness rises. And like any common drug addict, the addiction to the idea that money is the objective of life will give me power, give me happiness. It's a cliche to say that that doesn't work. But cliches are what they are, cliches, because they're true. And what has happened at this moment in time is um, the entire conservation effort that we made for the last 40 years or 50 years or even before that, the game has changed. The ground rules have changed. We used to have the goalposts on that side and this side on a lengthwise football field. Now the goalposts are on the side. The rules have changed, but many of us, including people who are fighting to protect the environment, are still playing on a field like this, while the guys who are destroying the place are playing in the right way, in quotes. They know how to now game the system. Um, they know how to reduce your power, my power. So oh, many of us here have had threats, OK? When they find that threats don't work, you've seen Amit Jethwa and P.D. Mahi, etc., who I just showed that there are only two of something like 40 or 50 people who have been killed trying to protect. When threats don't work, then they take action. And every time they take action, so many more people go away saying either it's the family or this or that. The pressure has come. Um, that's not the all of it. Suppose even that doesn't work. Then what they do is, the strategy is to destroy your credibility. That person, you don't know. He takes money from these people in order to do this. That's why he's doing this. I've been accused of wanting to save wildlife just to increase the circulation of my magazine, Sanctuary. You know? So at some times, it's almost humorous. At some times, it's tragic. But there are four horsemen of the apocalypse, if I can remember all their names. One is ignorance. One is avarice. One is apathy. And the fourth one will come to me. I always forget this. The four horsemen of the apocalypse. Ignorance, avarice, apathy, and somebody else? Anything? Anger? No, anger doesn't quite cut it. Anyway, it will come back to me. The, these, these things, these, the combination of these various things, arrogance, that's the one I was forgetting. It's the combination of these things which is causing all the problems, or rather preventing solutions from coming into place. What role do you have? What role do I have? There's a misunderstanding uh, in, in the minds of people that I have to be a wildlife defender. Now, even way back in 30 years ago, when Sanctuary started, we were storytellers. We were not wildlife defenders. In my life, I had never, ever written a letter to my parents when I was in boarding school. I barely got married, and we, there we are, starting Sanctuary. And at that point, the only thing that occurred to me was the words of a man called Fateh Singh Rathod, who, who made Ranthambore what it is. I went to him and I said that I want to help to save wildlife. Like any one of you would say, I want to help to save wildlife. I'd been going to Ranthambore for seven years. And uh, he said, you want to save wildlife? I'll tell you what you can do. Go back to Bombay and you have a party every month. I thought he had some fundraising in mind. We had had a couple of drinks here and there around a nice campfire. And uh, then he said, then you, after that, you come back and tell me, Fateh, what can I do to help you save the tiger? What are you Bombay guys good for? You'll do nothing. You'll have parties. You'll go there. You'll come here. You'll talk Maja Luto here. And then you go back. Something got to me and I said, I'm going to start a magazine because that is what he had told me earlier today. I wish there was a magazine. He said, there are so many wildlife, there are so many political magazines, there are sports magazines, there are new magazines, XYZ magazines, not one single wildlife magazine of the nature that we want. Inspired by the National Geographic, we started Sanctuary. And that has a, a direct bearing on what I'd like to communicate today. Way back then, People never understood. There's a vast difference. I said the game 
rules have changed. There's a vast difference to what was when the magazine was launched in 1981. There's a vast difference between then and now. At this point today, I don't think we need to convince people that the biosphere needs to be saved. I think people generally know that. Even the people who are destroying it know that what we are doing is wrong. At that point, I've been accused of many things. I've been accused of being a CIA spy. Uh, I've been accused by some lodge owners at that point in Bandhavgarh when we stopped the tiger show because uh, a minister wanted to come and a tigress with three cubs was held by four elephants for a period of three and a half, four hours in the heat of summer. And in the event, we stopped it and he said, you just want to destroy tourism. And tourism was what we created in order to get people to see the forest. Otherwise, how will they protect it? Here, are, here is where we are now. I have never in the last 30 years or so, though we started something like about 15 years ago, talking about climate change, Greenpeace was talking about it. It was an outlier. At this point in time, I didn't ever expect that the United Nations uh, General Secretary will get up and say it's madness what we are doing. I didn't expect Professor uh, Partho Das Gupta to come up with a report that says that look, the pandemic was a direct result of the wildlife trade. A direct result of the wildlife trade, which is a $40 billion trade, which caused a $40 trillion economic loss. I didn't expect that he would then take it still further and say that it's not just the wildlife trade, it's the destruction of ecosystems. It's like, love me, love my dog. If you're going to destroy forests and the animals are going to come out, they're going to come out with their viruses. So these, at this point, I want us to know what the impact of the pandemic was and why it took place. It had been predicted almost like a script. In, from something like about 2012 onward, people said, it looks to us that bats are carrying viruses which are easily transmissible. And if it's not, they're not touching the bats directly, everybody, there will be a transmission. There'll be a transmission from a bat to another animal. It turns out it was probably, even now they're not saying it's 100%, they say 99%. It was a free-tailed bat that transmitted it to the pangolin, the largest traded mammal in the world. And then from there, yes, it went everywhere because it's Chinese traditional medicine, etc. And yes, it went to Wuhan. We don't know. After that, the conspiracy theories take over. But the bottom line, the bottom line is, actually, it was written by a man called Lord Nicholas Stern. He used to be the chief economist of the World Bank. He's with the London School of Economics till today. He was an advisor to the British Prime Minister at that point, Gordon Brown who had given him a year and said, go out, tell us what the impact of this climate, this is 13, 14 years ago, what is the impact of climate change going to be on the British economy? And when he came back with the report, it was clear, it's not just the British economy, it's the whole world's economy. It was going to actually be under the kind of threat that has never been experienced before, but it takes time for those threats to become apparent. One line from Nicholas Stern from his report basically said that climate change is the clearest evidence we will have, could have, and now we do have of market failure. Unbridled market growth has caused the climate crises. We can get into debates and things like this, but this is not a time for debate. We're on the Titanic. There's a hole in the, uh, the, the ship's hull. The water is pouring in. And still till today, there are people in the state rooms arguing. I want the drapes to be more. Why have you made them purple? I want, to, why is my champagne not cold? I'm, I'm only stretching a point to make a point. There's still a coterie of people, very powerful people who don't believe. They don't, they don't deny anymore. And those of us who are fighting for for biodiversity must know that it is the same thing, Jodwa Bhai. They are the same thing. There's no difference between protecting and or losing biodiversity and protecting or having the climate go out. The entire carbon cycle is dependent upon the living creatures that exist in the ocean mainly, but also in our forests, also in our grasslands, also in our deserts. 
also in our wetlands. In fact, our wetlands today hold possibly as much carbon as exists in our atmosphere. And yet wetlands and grasslands are the fastest vanishing ecosystems. These are the problems. Now, the, why I wanted you to just get a jhalak of this film is, when we produced the film, I used to speak and I'd say that in 10 years' time, this is what's going to happen, that's going to happen. And a lot of people used to say that. I can't be truthful and say that. I'm telling you, it's going to happen this year. It's already started. It's not just Joshima. It's, it's, uh, it's all over. I mean, I think Karnataka has seen floods. Kerala has seen floods. Maharashtra has seen floods. Pakistan was under water. 40-50% of Pakistan was under water. Srinagar had seen floods. There are bluffs, you know, the, where, when, when glacial melt takes place and it goes behind rocks, then suddenly, because there's nothing over there, it comes down and lay had floods. All this... It is your job and my job not to go out over there and with a lathi protect the lion or the tiger or the elephant. Whatever we do, if you're a poet, write poetry. If you're a journalist, write, use your pen. If you're a businessman, it's not your money we need. In fact, we need you to spend less money. If you spend less money, the, the biosphere will come back to life. And if you're an actor, for instance, why do these people pay one crore of rupees, two crores of rupees to actors to say, I use this toothpaste? It's because vast numbers believe them. They have their eyeballs on them. So I would say that if you're an actor, if you're somebody in the public eye, use your visibility. In other words, do what you're best at. Don't be a fish that's trying to climb a tree. Don't try to be like Ulas Karanth. Because he's one of the best scientists there was. You may not be the best scientist, but you can do something. Use his science to do what you do well. So that is the basic answer of what we can do. We can only do that which we are good at, what we enjoy doing, for what we have the stamina to do. I don't think... I find myself very uncomfortable sometimes when people tell me because they don't do what I do, run a magazine for 40 years, this, that and the other, go out over there, write the CRZ rules, write all kinds of things, use, use the, uh, environmental sensi the, the, the environmentally sensitive zone, zonation was created under the, uh, the, the Environment Act. Because why? Why did we do that? Because we found that we had, we had Project Tiger as part of the Project Tiger committee. We said, this is, this is the forest and this is the buffer area. I said, you might as well call it the duffer area because it, it, there's no legal protection there. So we decided that we'll use the, 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 the act, a different act, a central act. At that point, we still had some support. I, I want to say at this point that we are not at the edge. We have already started crumbling. I expect... Year after year after year, not just India, I expect that we are going to see the new normal is going to be climate change is going to change our dependability. Dependability on what? Take a farmer. Suppose you were a farmer. You don't know when to harvest. You're supposed to, let's say the monsoon was supposed to arrive on the 7th of June. But the monsoon damn well arrived 10 days earlier. So you don't know when to sow. Then when it comes to time to harvest, you expect that the monsoon will have stopped. But it carries on raining for another month. So the crop that you haven't yet harvested is destroyed. By rain, that is unpredictable. Why is this taking place? Because there is a, there is a magic. For a moment, if I may ask you just to pretend you're 12 years old. My constituency actually is the average age is 12 to 15. So you guys are a little too old for me, but nevertheless, I'll give it a try. This is what we tell children. Would you like to live in a magic home? The doors are made of chocolate. The windows are lollipop. You put on the tap and you get like lemonade. Every stone you pick up is tasty. You go to sleep, boom, everything comes back again. They said, yes, Uncle Bitu, we would love to live in a house like that. I said, suppose somebody came and destroyed your house. Uncle Bitu, how can they do that? Why would they do that? I said, but every monkey, every squirrel, every bird lives in a magic house. It lives in the tree, it eats the tree, and the tree comes back to life again. So the whole planet is a magic place.
planet. Now comes the other thing which is for children. Incidentally, at uh, the Indian Merchants Chambers in Bombay, when I gave a similar analogy, I didn't talk about a magic home. I said, suppose you're talking about uh, you know, cars, self-driving cars and things like this. Suppose I had like that. I gave you a car, you come to me, I buy it, I give you a lifetime guarantee, not only for the car. You never have to fill petrol in it. You scratch something at night, it gets back again. The fenders come up again. Your tire gets bust, it fixes itself all through your life. How would you like a car like that? And they're as taken aback as the kids. And I said, but that is what nature is. It is a continuous self-repairing machine. You just have to understand this. And if you do understand this, then two things happen. We have about one million children in what we call Kids for Tigers. The tiger is just a metaphor. It's just a metaphor for nature itself. And as far as, as, far as we are concerned, when we go out to the children, we have a responsibility to them and I have a responsibility to you. I can't paint this doom and gloom because there is doom and gloom. But I can't focus on that because that's only 5% of the reality. The other 5% is that even as you're destroying something, a butterfly is coming and, and fixing it, you know. So understand this, that ecological grief is real. I think every one of us in this room surely has felt it at some time or the other. It's not just the pandemic that has caused this. We've seen something so beautiful that we have, in my case, I'll speak from personal experience. I, there are places we have spent, I'm 75 years old, I've spent 50 years protecting and I've seen it now being destroyed. That has to cause me grief. My daughters are telling me you need to go into therapy, you think that you're okay, you're going ha ha he he and all that, but inside we know what's happening to you. So how do we deal with ecological grief, each one of us? If you don't deal with that, you won't be able to do anything to stop anything because you'll, you'll either get cynical or you'll get tired, or you'll get so angry that you'll blah, 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 and nobody will believe what you're saying or listen to you. We have to be rational, but we have to believe that the planet can fix itself. If the planet homeostasis, when you get a temperature from 98.4, 98.6, it goes to 101, you start sweating, it cools you down, it comes back. The planet is exactly the same. It is trying desperately to, to get the heat that we have put up, it's, it's anthropogenic, it's all done by us. We just need to make sure that we don't use fossil fuels and that we restore ecosystems back to life like Project Tiger did, but with one difference. When Project Tiger was started out in 1973, 1st of April, in the Corbett National Park, the objective was straightforward. People were shooting tigers, they've been shooting them for 200 years, and um, they were almost wiped out, save the tiger. That was what Project Tiger was about. But Kailash Sankhla or Fateh Singh Rathor or so many of the other people, Chinnappa from here, all of them, what they knew was that these are the sources of our river. So what you need to do is to use, first understand, absorb and do it because you feel that it's right and do it in the way that you feel you can do the right thing, which is to say that explain the self-interest involved in protecting the biosphere. If there was a small house plant this big, it couldn't grow from a seed to a plant without pulling atmospheric carbon down. It can take nitrogen, it can take minerals, it can take water from the roots, but it can't take carbon from the, from the ground. It has to get it. It's called photosynthesis. It's taught to children, you know, eight, nine, ten year old kids know that. So it's one thing for us to rely upon engineers. The guys who caused the problem, let's say a civil engineer and a banker and they all got together and they built roads and they did this and that and the others. One thing to go to them and say, oh, some people have even said, you know, we'll take these satellites up, we'll put them up, we'll put large scale equivalent of umbrellas and the result will be less uh, sunlight coming down and the earth. I said, listen, you want to kill us all? Please go ahead and do that. I mean, that's a quicker way to cause the world to come to an end. On the other hand, Restore the grasslands, restore the, wet, uh, the wetlands, bring the mangroves back where they are, allow the forests to come back. Easier said than done in a country particularly like India, but, but in India, we have an attitude that is singularly missing in what used to be the G5 countries, you know, 
America. A wolf goes from here to here in America and he gets shot. Why does he get shot? Because he stepped from this place to this place, he's shot. He's not, he's only supposed to live here. Now, who can explain to, an, to, a, to a bear or to a wolf that you're not lying? And yet, and yet, that wolf is part and parcel of the maintenance of this forest. Whether it's a wolf, whether it's a bee, whether it's a bird, whether it's a snake, whether it's a, a mole, a vole, anything. These are the maintenance engineers of our planet. Once we understand this, it's for us to decide how we are going forward next to make it happen. It can only happen, it can only happen eventually when either or one of two things happen. One, you take the Himalayan dams, frankly, they are stranded assets. I don't know one banker or one actuary who actually has calculated the risk involved in putting a billion dollars on dams in the Himalaya, when we know that's an earthquake prone zone, when we know that the, the glaciers are melting. So use logic in whatever you do, whether you talk to a 10 year old or whether you talk to the prime minister or whether you talk to a, a powerful bureaucrat who controls everything until he retires. You know, just use logic. Don't get provoked. Don't get dismayed. Don't lose hope. We will not lose until the day we give up. In the end, Usha, we tell that to our children that homeostasis, look up that word homeostasis on Google. Um, it just means that things come back. We are not going to necessarily die tomorrow, but our lives are going to be very uncomfortable but they can come back. You have to believe that like religion, like many people believe that God will make everything right. I would say that when somebody asked me what my concept of God is, I said it's the sound of the leaves rustling when the wind blows through it. It's the sound of the water gurgling. And what, I, what do I want for my children? I want nothing other than the fact that they should be safe and they should be happy. I want them to swim in a river and drink the water at the same time. I want the skies to be blue. I, I don't want them to take in a breath into lungs where asthma becomes part and parcel of every day or take the puff and go to school. Oh, the AQI is too much, you can't play tennis today. That's not life. That's not what we have to do. So if we're convinced, I think that we'll be able to do what we have to do. As I said, I don't have any major gyan to give. I will just say this, I will never give up. I will never give up. I don't know what the meaning of the word give up is. It's like saying that my child kidnapper is coming I tried so hard to stop him, now he is not stopping, now what can I do? Would you do that? I wouldn't do that. I feel the same way that this planet, I belong to it and it belongs to me. And my generation, I am ashamed to say, we never fought for our independence, but my generation, what I tell the children, Usha, Buddha party and Bacha party, I said the, the Buddha party is now colonizing the Bacha party. It's called intergenerational colonization. So yes, I'm angry, but please, I promise you that anger emerges only amongst my own. It never emerges when I'm fighting either the carbon lobby or the coal lobby or the timber lobby or the poaching trade or anything, because there's no point anger with them. That's what they would, they, if you start getting angry and start frothing at the mouth, then the words that you speak will be put on the side and the way you've spoken, it becomes the story. You must never be the story yourself. The story must remain focused because we are on the winning side. We are on the winning side because of incidents like Joshimat. We are on the winning side because of incidents like the Mithi River floods that took place. Study, learn, ask, share. Don't worry about who did this and whose credit and whose name was in this. It's easier said than done, but study understand and then communicate. I think we can have um, the lights on a little brighter maybe and uh, there must be questions, there must be things that have gone on at least five, seven minutes more than I wanted to. I don't know how much time we have. I know that we stop at on the dot off. How much time do we have now? 10 minutes, 12? Okay, you, you just ring the bell when you, when, when you stop and I'll jump off the stage, all right? So, 
uh, if, there, if there are any questions, I'd be very happy to answer them. And if I can't answer them, I'll ask somebody else in the audience to answer them. Please, sir. Um, it would be great if they know. I know your name, but if, if they know who you are and what you're doing. Oh, I presumed everybody does. Would you get up and talk about Ramki a little bit? No, I'll, I'll tell you, I want somebody who, know, who lives in, in Bangalore to do that. I'll tell you a little story about Ramki. I mean... Um, if everyone could step up to the mic there to ask the question, we'd really appreciate it. Ramki, when he came back to India... Yeah, it might be easier to do that if we could. Ah, there's a record. Well, Ramki, when he came to India with, with Sanctuary, he came to Sanctuary and he said that, look, this is what we want to do. He was, he was a, he's a technical genius. And he said, give us, give us content and we'll turn it into this, 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 this. And he wanted to turn everything into, uh, to reach the younger generation through the digital media. And that's what Ramki, I'm talking 17, 18, 20 years ago. I don't know exactly what the dates were. But Ramki, Conservation India, he's one of the most, I still speak about him in the present tense, can you believe that? He's one of the most rational, most determined, most uh, strategic conservationists I've seen, almost I would say ever, you know, in India. And uh, he's brave, he was tough, but he fell to what none of us can stop. Somebody, please tell stories about Ramki. You live here. I know Ramki as somebody who lives in my heart still, and I can't speak about him in the past tense still. Anybody else would like to get up and say something about Ramki? You're elected. Hey, would you use a mic? He's, he's got a mic here for you, I think. Name and... Yeah, uh, this is Vikram. I'm... Uh, from Conservation India, among various other things. Um, so very uh, personal for me to talk about Ramki because you know, I did, we had a lot of uh, other common interests as well outside of just wildlife, whether it was single malt or coffee or a hundred other things. We tried to do a startup together. Lars was here. So we did a lot of things. Uh, but the one thing that bound us as this, you know, thread always was uh, wildlife and our deep love for it. And I think the frustration came out in every single conversation that we had. We would meet for something else, but most times you would end up talking about how things go wrong in this country about, <laughs> about our wildlife. Uh, we ran a lot of campaigns. I helped with Amar Falcon. I helped with Narkandam. I helped with a lot of those. We set it up. Uh, Conservation India was built by my team, my previous startup when I was running it. Uh, so from day one, you know, when I met him, I originally met him because I wanted to start a uh, donation gateway for wildlife NGOs because none of the donation gateways in India care about wildlife. So you won't see a single one. The closest I saw, I think, was Give India, which said, buy uh, eco-friendly chulas. I, like, <laughs> I said, how is this wildlife? <laughs> and, you know, yeah. So I wanted to beat that. And that's when I met him. And he said, you know, I've got something bigger cooking. Do you want to you know, be part of this? And that's when we built Conservation India as a thing. And uh, it's been an incredible decade plus working with him. And um, he had. I mean, I don't think I would have seen anyone braver handling what he had, uh, just so that many of you may not know, he had, uh, he was diagnosed with lung cancer a few years back, five years back, and he fought back successfully. Uh, it was post-complications that kind of led to his uh, premature demise. He was not in 50 yet. And um, I think wildlife was something which is a part of life for us. So, I mean, for us, it was every conversation. You would meet for coffee and you would still talk about this campaign or that campaign. And every time you wanted to step away, okay, I'm going to drop you off now. Just one last thing that, I think there is that one thing that we need to do. And we would, and it would always eventually, you know, lead to some post we were putting up. Uh, there was something on, you know, the last thing was, you know, there's this dolphin kill. Somebody put a photo. Did you put that up? Did you follow up that guy? And did you ask him about <laughs> submitting this content? Uh, Dibang, when you just mentioned Dibang, Dibang was among the last campaigns that we, ran until the government uh, um, literally blocked, Facebook literally blocked my credit card from 
uh, running campaigns, they said we are a political organization for some reason. Oh my good lord. Uh, so my credit card is banned on <laughs> Facebook. So, uh, but that, that's, and he said that's okay, we'll figure out a different way of doing this. And uh, we were in the midst of building a completely new platform. We realized Conservation India um, till date had been um, a broadcast medium. And we wanted to make it a more inclusive platform for everyone to start contributing. And that's what we had been working through. And as things are with Ramki, he's extremely meticulous about design. And he was like, every font, every line, everything had to be cleaned up. And I was sitting yeah, and waiting. Ramki, all right. <laughs> and the last, last time we spoke was on a call. And he said, you know, let's review. And I still remember he said, I think this one is off by two pixels. I think that was the last sentence I actually spoke with him. And he said, um, post that, he couldn't speak. Um, you know, he lost ah. his speech at that time. And he said, this red line is off by two pixels. If you're not able to see it, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> you know, that, that's Ramki, all right. Yeah, so that will probably remind my, yeah. you know, lasting memory of him. Look, each one of us has our stories about Ramki. I mean, I can remember Fateh Singh and so many people have gone. I remember Perumal. Perumal was one of those people who, his photograph spoke, you know. And Sanctuary was dedicated to the idea of using photographs to protect because people who haven't gone into the forest, how can they feel the loss of something, you know? So each one of us, each one of us, sir, you've been taking things we write and translating them into languages so that people can read them in the local languages. I mean, I don't know. I, I really would like, I really would like us here. Bangalore is the heart of the conservation movement in more ways than one, even though Delhi is where all the damage and the destruction takes place, you know. So, I, yes, please. Anybody? Yeah. No, I had a question. Actually. Yeah, please. Is that okay? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so, you, uh, you said that uh, you started the whole tourism, wildlife tourism, in order to get more awareness going among people so that conservation could be helped, right? Today, do you still feel that it's a good thing? Because I go, I go into the jungles as a tourist, and I go a lot. Initially, oh. I used to think that I'm actually contributing, you know, and I'm actually <sighs> spreading um, awareness. I sent a lot of my family members. I got them interested in going to the jungles. But today, after all these years of going, I feel it's become more about the photography, the social media, the breaking of the rules, bribing the drivers, guys, it's, it's business again. So yeah. what is your view on that? And um, at times I'm, I'm contradicted, you know, by going to the jungle as a tourist. Am I adding to the problem? You're not adding to the problem. If you, if you understand, if you're already asking that question, you're not adding to the problem. First thing, you're aware of it. There are many people who are unaware of anything. They, they've gone, the only tiger they've seen is in a zoo. So they think it's the same. I've seen a clip recently of a guy going, following a tiger that's walking like this and he's going, he's left his jeep and he's taking a picture like this and the tiger's 20 feet ahead, tiger looks and still walks away. But the point is just this, that tourism is a conservation tool. Let's start with that. Tourism is a conservation tool. The camera is a conservation tool. The pen is a conservation tool. Now I can use that pen to write bad things. I can use the camera to do bad things. I can use tourism in a way where I learn to game the system. We can't throw the baby out with the bath. If nobody goes into the forest, where on earth are they going to, are you going to f create a bolus of people who are going to say, like the kids today, the kids have actually understood. The kids are the ones that stopped fathers from smoking at one point. The kids are the ones that stop people from burning firecrackers in Delhi. I'm a Punjabi, so I can say that. A good Punjabi guy, yaar, one, my, who, my child wants to burn that cracker and the guy is going on burning 30 crackers while the child is still asleep, you know. So I'm saying that it's, it's necessary for us to keep things in perspective. Tourism is a conservation tool. If it's badly used, let's tackle the bad use. And let's wean people away because people like me, we fell in love. I also came only to see the tiger. But it's another matter that in 10 days, we never used to see tigers. In fact, when we found one tiger dropping, Pate Singh and myself were there around the campfire. We came across, we jointly produced this ditty. Tiger, tiger burning bright in the forests of the night. I searched through grass, I searched through matti. All I found was tiger tatti. You know, so, so, and, you know, I, I'm just saying that, look, 
we were so happy to see a pagma kare there are tigers here now if we protected that area first of all the local community did not get any benefit from that i'm not talking of drivers and things i'm talking about the community so we want now i spoke to vijay mohan raj today we are meeting him again saying that the people on the outside in africa you got to buy an elephant and put him into a chain link fence and buy a tiger and buy buy a, buy a lion and buy a buffalo etc for 10000 dollars here the government is protecting there's a nursery it's producing why should people on the outside not benefit by us going into their area with a tigress with a cubs see the see that thing go bird watching while looking for the tiger which we never saw for 10 days we were watching monkeys we were sitting down quietly contemplating that akbar invaded tried to get this fort and he did not manage and in the akbar nama it was written what we ate so many things came in that made us feel and fall in love but this whole business of going out to see tiger dekha tiger dekha are kuch nahi bekar trip ho gaya yaar tiger mila hi nahi what did you see are ek ko kala sa safed tha i saw ratel yaar i said what you saw a ratel past the road in the day ha huh? but it was a small thing it just ran across क्या देखा अरे कुत्ता देखा यार पता नहीं कुत्ते कितने होते शहर में कुत्ता देखने थोड़ी आया हूं मैं सो दैट्स आर फॉल्ट दैट्स द फॉल्ट ऑफ पीपल लाइक मी दैट वी हैवन बीन एबल टू लाइक मी मीन मी प्लस वन हंड्रेड थाउजेंड पीपल आई थिंक वी ऑल गेट द पिक्चर आई थिंक वी ऑल गेट द पिक्चर बट दिस मच आई कैन टेल यू सब यस So the mic. So I, I, you are our lifetime awardee. I know you, but tell them. No, my my concern is. No, that, who? who? Oh, I am Theodore Baskaran. Ah, no, no. Ah, no. uh, the whole uh, discourse on wildlife is taking place in English. Okay, and it's not reaching the. people who do not know english yeah and in this category many legislators also come yeah and the people who are very living very close to the sanctuaries without their good will we are not going to protect the wildlife so should we not concentrate on this area of uh, carrying on the discourse in the language of the area now the problem is we do we have to empower the language before we start uh, uh, addressing our concern that's not happening yeah. that's it that's so much you know here we are look at the number of languages look at the number of dialects i mean it's completely true if somebody came from france and said je ne sais pas Okay, you might be talking about the world coming to an end, but if I don't understand, how am I going to be moved? I agree with you, sir. I agree with you completely. And as much as I might criticize Google, now you can type in something into Google. At least they'll give you some broken Tamil or broken Telugu <laughs> or broken Bengali, you know. At you know, but your point is very well taken, and I think that that's one of the. But I want to respond to that thing. I think that those. Mike, can you pass the mic to? Her? Yeah. what she says is that those people have read about it they have felt it and they have an understanding that maybe doesn't we matter if they don't know that. english i feel that those who don't know english have probably understood nature much better than us we have you know we are busy sort of uh, elitizing ourselves if i can use such a word and you know when you said about the pandemic i think i must be the odd man out who says that i quite enjoyed the lockdown because i could see the trees i could see the bees i could hear the see the butterflies i mean it's a very funny reaction i keep getting asked are you wonky No, I'm not. <laughs> I found the streets. I actually found the streets walkable. I actually found the air breathable. I mean, it's a very nasty thing to say for people who. But a million people died. No, but I mean, I did get I did get to breathe clean air. I'm not looking at no, the no, that I, part of it. I you know? understand exactly what you're saying, yeah. and I agree with you. I agree with you. You know what my sense of the pandemic was? That it showed us that it is that homeostasis. you just stop doing the damage when people say we want to give you so much money i said you look so much suppose you give 10 billion dollars 
What would that $10 billion do? The World Bank loaned Project Tiger $100 million. Part of it was payback. And what happened? Chowkis which were just chowkis that melted in suddenly became two, two-story, three-story chowkis in Ranthambur. Then we had to go and have those chowkis de demolished. Computers came, this came, that came, but it didn't get spent the right way. So I'm saying to you that, look, we have to understand. Now I said to you the football pitch, the goals are not lengthwise, they're on sidewise. Here is what I'm saying, the bottom line with conservation today. If what Darwin said was true, it's not the most powerful, it's not even the most intelligent who will survive, it's the most adaptable. And if we don't adapt to what we can see, like the pandemic should have been able to tell us that if we do nothing, nature will come back. Rivers will run pure again. Things will come back and at a remarkable pace, not fast enough for us. We want everything instant like coffee, you know. It will take five years, seven years, but it will come back. Yeah, please. Okay, so I have. I'll need help from somebody too. I, I didn't look up. Please. So, go ahead. so you mentioned the story about you talking to Fateh Singh and he's saying go back to Mumbai and party. Uh, it is very interesting. Um, I want to actually move back that story to Bangalore very tactically. Let's say I'm a software engineer in Bangalore, right? Interested in uh, protecting the diversity, but I have a career to work in a software company and that takes up most of my time. You know, very tactically, how can I contribute towards this cause on a day-to-day -day basis, in your view? What's, <laughs> the, what's the best Shinivasan way? comes to mind, you know. I'll tell you something, you know. Specific to you, the best habitat for the tiger is the human heart and it's your heart. Once you know that you feel, not just, I love the tiger, but the fact that the tiger represents something that is the biosphere and... The economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the biosphere. Once you understand that, then your knowledge, your tech knowledge, which is what can reach the under 30s, under 20s, though that's the generation that I don't know how to reach effectively. You can help us reach it. It may not be you. It might be somebody you know. But that world, the world of technology, is now being used to destroy the biosphere. Out and out, I'm making a statement. The more technology we have, the quicker the biosphere is vanishing. The glaciers are melting, the poles are melting, the, the soils are get, the, the aquifers are getting saline because we've learned how to do this. So I would say that I don't know specifically which part of technology, but I'll make a broad statement. Bangalore is, I mean, there's even a word, I've been Bangalored, you know. Yeah. So if there's a word like that, that means we've got the brains trust here. We should be exporting our ability, marrying our ability to understand technology and resurrect the reverence we feel for nature. We still worship nature. I've been to a restaurant where a big, huge rat come, just passed by and the watchman get, went with his big lati. I said, yeah, this was very good. You didn't hit the rat. He said, sir, that's also a jeev. Hai. Try and explaining this to somebody in New York, you know. So I'm saying that we, we have an attitude which we must not lose. The fact that you asked that question, already you've stepped over the line because you want to make a difference using... I, wouldn't, I would say don't try to become an artist. You stay with your profession and turn it... I can't tell you how precisely because you will know. I won't even know how to program anything, you know, or how to you. I don't even know the technology that can help. But certainly when somebody goes up, like I did in the upper, uh, to the lower Sovansari Dam, um, planned statement was made by uh, an officer of the zoological society, uh, zoological whatever, you know, the, the sorry? Survey. Survey of India. And said, these are all secondary forests. I said, what? He said they're second. So when I asked the watchman, because we went a week after them, he said, Sir, they didn't go outside the rest house. They went out in a helicopter and then came back. So I had walked up as far as my legs would carry me and I found a guy fishing and I found this and we found, uh, you know, all kinds of things. Look, we just have to want to do it and we must understand that we don't give up. I, I'd like to speak for teachers right now. I have two daughters. 
Uh, I always knew my, that the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. But I know that when my grandchildren grew to be four years old and five years old and they went to school, my daughters were saying, now we can have a life. Teachers are the ones that hold the future of this country in their hands. Sanctuary certainly goes to teachers. I think WWF does the same. So many people go to teachers. Please tell me when we have to cut off. Okay. Hi. Please. I'm Sharda. I'm yeah. working in clean energy and in my life also I try to be very sustainable, composting, recycling, all those things I do. Uh, so I'm trying my bit. But one certain thing from my childhood was I always had crows, sparrows around my house, even somewhere bees also. And uh, that is something I really miss seeing a sparrow, uh, hmm. seeing a crow. Uh, so is, is there anything I could incorporate in my life and probably like in a year or so I could see one sparrow in my window. <laughs> uh, it is actually like, it's been years I've, I have not seen a sparrow. And I cannot go, I mean, in Kabun Park I go, I hear some birds chirping. Uh, but, uh, I mean, it's just... Look, some of the best birders in India are here in your city. Kabun Park is a miracle, it's not a park, it's a miracle. The fact that Bangalore has been so badly damaged in so many places, the germplasm to bring it back exists. I believe that the fact that you want to see that sparrow, you want to see the other birds, you want to hear the natural sounds means you must... I don't... What did you say you do as a profession? I'm in clean energy. Clean energy, all right. So that just one single thing. If your life mission becomes together with people that I want blue skies, that's it. If you just want blue skies, the economy will improve, health will improve, children will be much, much happier, there will be fewer divorces. All these things will happen because you decided, like we wanted to save the tiger, we made the tiger the, the indicator species, make blue skies your indicator species. And make that blue sky into a mission and work with younger people. My generation, quite frankly, I don't want to say everybody, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a bad guy, but the fact is that my generation, I start when I talk to kids, Theodore, when I talk to kids, I start with an apology. I say, I am sorry. My parents, my grandparents fought for the freedom of this country. I was gifted it. And I am taking away your freedom. The British came and they colonized us geographically. We are doing intergenerational colonization. So I would say to you, take that clean air. Turn it into clean skies. The moment there's something, you get AQI. Talk to people, speak to people, write to people, talk to people, you know. The chief minister must get it, the environment minister must get it. And if somebody is doing a good job in the municipal corporation, write 100 postcards to that man that what a good job you're doing. So he can show his postcards to his kid and say, look, somebody appreciates me. Yes. Yeah. Um, Please. My name is Milin. And uh, just a joke, I think you said, um, you know, Bangalore, is uh, is a good word. I think these days there's a negative connotation. Of course there it's is. Yes. Bangalore means pothole. Yes, yes. Uh, in, oh, in, in, in Bangalore. <laughs> um, but jokes aside, thank you so much for your talk and <laughs> and uh, and more importantly for your passion. Um, uh, you know, you said that we are no longer in denial. I think that because there are so many climate incidents that are happening, uh, so obviously we're not in denial. The fact that there are so many of us here uh, listening to you also shows that a, a fair number of people are interested to understand what's happening and more importantly understand what we can do. But I think the larger uh, percentage of the population is reasonably unaware and the expectation is that the governments around the world, including here in India, will take the lead, they will solve the problem, and if they're not solving the problem, who am I to do anything? And I have a question, which is that, you know, can we improve the engagement of the common person by helping him understand what is his, way, as he goes about, you know, his normal life, um, you know, driving a car, uh, commuting to work, living in a house with air conditioners, um, you know, taking a flight uh, frequently, etc. What is my carbon footprint? 
how much damage am I causing? Can there be like an easy app which can be popularized, which just says, okay, if this is your lifestyle, then this is your carbon footprint as an individual. And therefore, if I am aware, then to your point, I can do things which I am suitable at doing. You're, you're, you're editing a magazine, he's a technology person and he can use his technology, I can do something. But to begin with, what is the damage that I as an individual am causing? If I can be aware of that, perhaps I'll be more engaged. How completely right are you? I mean, that is actually at the heart of everything, you know. And actually, I've, we've spoken to psychologists and therapists, and to counter ecological grief, we have to do what you're suggesting now, that is, convey to somebody what little they can do. Actually, Gandhiji was way, I think he was wasted on the freedom of India. You know, he, we needed him now. To, to free us from our own selves. I would say to you that um, if you do anything, suppose it's nothing other than you and five other people clearing up a footpath that was filled with plastic, etc., etc., apart from writing and saying plastic can't be recycled, it can only be downcycled, etc., you send that to the policy makers. But you will live a better life by just cleaning up that little place. I'm talking cleaning up. She will live a better life by bringing sparrows back, by hearing that. Somebody else will live a better life by beating the sky blue. You know, so you do what you do. But don't do it because of me. Don't do it because of him. Don't do it because of him. Do it because it makes you happy on the inside. You should go to sleep at night wanting to do what you think you can do tomorrow morning like Ramki. Last minute. By the way, this one thing as well. So there was, there's a question there, I think. Am I right? Yeah, OK. Uh, hi, my name is Rohit. Um, to, to follow up on the Bangalore uh, concept, I think now it's, uh, it has a negative connotation. Uh, I came in late here uh, because today I happened to go to Sarjapur. It took me 90 minutes to come here. And oh, God. It's, uh, That's also Bangalore. No, it's horrible. And I've grown up in the city, and you spoke about loss. So uh, I've seen this loss of the soul of the city, which all the green cover, except the miracle, which is Kavan Park. I think the whole scenery of Bangalore has changed. and. Uh, where the road which I used to drive to, and they don't have trees anymore. It's there is a deep sense of loss, and uh, the more I'm staying in my own city, I'm just getting more and more cynical. So uh, I, yeah, so and that sort of I guess relates to the concept of carrying capacity of any place, and we saw that with Joshi Mutt also. Uh, so in a densely populated country like India, how do we manage this carrying capacity of the land, like? Can we can it support so many people and with the style of development or uh, politics or economics which we have uh, like what's the way forward for that? And uh, I just had another side question about um, light pollution. Uh, in, um, I feel hardly anybody in India has seen up seen the dark sky, seen the stars, uh, because you cannot find dark spaces anymore except maybe if you go to the middle of a forest. Uh, and in the U.S., I've gone to like. They're, they're, they have specific dark sky parks. They've made one in Ladakh now, but uh, in the US there are quite a few. And the first time I saw the Milky Way, it obviously blew my mind, and I'd never seen it like that. And uh, the more um, the transition to um, LEDs now, uh, the white LEDs, I feel, everywhere, they, uh, they sort of like convert the night into day, day which is yeah. the night is supposed to be dark. And I feel everywhere they're just putting these white LEDs all over. and. Uh, there's no concept of um, having like soft lighting at night and sort of, you know, looking up at the sky. Beta, I understand yeah. what you're saying and you don't realize how scientific it is what you're saying because there are two, two things in this world. There's a timeshare going on. There's the nocturnal, there's the diurnal and there's the guys who roam around during the day. Darkness itself helps certain creatures survive. If you bring light into their lives, they'll vanish. You know, so apart from that, roadless wildernesses, the concept doesn't exist. Anywhere that you see that there is no, no road, you want to build the road through a forest because why? The forest is ours. But it's a, the forest is an ecosystem and the forest is an infrastructure. If I wanted to build a road, would I build it on top of a railway line? 
द रेलवे लाइन इज एन इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर द रोड इज एन इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर बट मैं उखाड़ थोड़ी दूंगा उसको कि भाई इट इज सो स्ट्रेट ओवर सो आई बिल्ड अ रोड ऑन टॉप ऑफ दट विल हैपन टू द टू द ट्रेन द सेम वे वॉट विल हैपन टू द मॉथ टू द आउल टू द नॉक्टर्नल क्रीचर्स दैट डू द टाइम शेयर द यूज द सेम ट्री द बैट्स वॉट विल हैपन टू दैम सो they don't look at that ecosystem services has become something that has now been almost kidnapped by short term economists who say that okay ecosystem services so i'll plant a trillion trees 4 billion trees 5 billion trees they toothpicks in the ground unless there's biodiversity attached to those trees so it's not a sunil it's not as though i plant 42 species therefore it's biodiverse the fact is that we are the world's worst planet managers homo sapiens should be called homo stupidus we do not know how to look after this planet but we have been given minds to enjoy what has been produced by so many creatures and i do agree with you on this one thing that there is an earthiness to people in rural india which is something that we had but we've lost so i would say that like at one time uh, i'm looking at that guy in red there sunil chanani i i say to you sunil that if you go on to a skyscraper in bangalore you will find so many roofs with nothing on it the largest open space in bangalore or bombay or delhi or chennai is the roof why aren't we using it either to grow food or to generate power for ourselves that is going to happen irrespective of what governments want to do what big time corporates want to do this is going to be what they what will happen in future those are the things that will change the city because you create the equivalent of green you created a butterfly garden you've created a place for birds to shelter you will hear your bird song everything will come back and it's so easy so the children you cut your hand you cut your cut your thing and it how does this cell and that cell know how to get together again we don't know you drive a car but do you know how the engine works frankly i'm looking forward to the day that the four stroke engine we bury it forever and ever yeah uh, yeah sorry there's there's here then there i, have a I am here. so delighted that <laughs> i'm so delighted that we've got engagement we're going to be able to make a difference please yes uh, my name is benedict i do a, my small bit i organize the green literature festival ah we did that in uh, bsc this year and we had uh, nearly 600 people wow and we get the authors and the readers to a common platform so just wanted to share that but my question is that the new narrative is about abundance super abundance so many economists and new books have come about uh, abundance that the world is currently has a lot of abundance it's going to get more abundant uh, how do you look at this against the narrative of climate change well we have an abundance of heat we have an abundance of water we have an abundance of disease we have an abundance of something that india india hasn't seen but i might talk to you about abundance in terms of an abundance of people no i'm not talking population i want us to think just for a second about syria now that was the fertile crescent mesopotamia that's where i believe women invented agriculture because the men would go out and hunt mammoths or whatever they would hunt and they would come back and women got tired of all this moving around and moving around and they said we threw a seed here it grew the fertile crescent it took four consecutive droughts for something like 4 million people to move when those 4 4 million people moved they moved into an area where there was already short supply of resources that was the seed of the syrian crisis we see today why am i talking about the syrian crisis i live in india think about your country think about my country think about our country the glaciers have melted in the sundarbans bangladesh i've just come from dhaka in sundarbans the sea levels are rising the people are drinking saline water because ordinary high tides are doing put 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 karke into their sweet water ponds little salt water is going but the kidney doesn't like that so we are going to find ourselves i am telling you we are going to find ourselves with a rash of kidney failure so i i mean my answers are not direct 
because the subject is amorphous, you know, it's so huge. All we need to do is to just stay on the straight and narrow and understand this one thing. Gandhi ji was, I won't say wasted on our freedom. The British would have probably done worse than what we are doing right now. But he also said that the man who does nothing because he can't do everything is the worst of the lot. Do anything small. If a lot of us do a little, a lot gets done. Ulas Karanth is a giant. He spent his whole life doing science. You may not be able to do what Ulas did. But at least you can do something in your neighborhood and say that, look, I used to see sparrows here. I don't see sparrows here. Make a sparrow map. Where are you seeing the sparrows? Even that's a contribution. Talk to children. If you're, if you're a doctor, then add, the, add your voice as a doctor. So we need credibility. And that's stupid four letter word called vote. It's not going to, it's not going to suddenly happen, Sunil, but the fact is that <laughs> if you don't vote, you're an idiot, you know. If you don't vote for a municipal election, you're an idiot because then you deserve everything. When I say you, I'm including myself, I, you're an idiot, you know. If you don't vote, you're an idiot. Doesn't matter if your vote is uh, not going to change the complexion of the world. But at least you've done, you had a question, I'm sorry. No, I, that's, that's okay, and it's, it sort of came from an earlier this thing. Through all that's going on, including everything that you've mentioned just now, how do you stay so optimistic? I mean, that is just... If, if, you, if you promise to tell my wife that I'm an optimist, I will carry you on my shoulders all the way to Bombay. <laughs> <clears throat> I stay an optimist. I am an optimist. Most people see me as a pessimist because actually I'm like an environmental proctologist, you know. Wherever there's some crap, I'm over there, you know. So, but it's a, it's a fact. To be honest, my loyalty is not to homo sapiens. My loyalty is to the biosphere. And I know I'm on the winning side. The biosphere will give you no judgments. You know, you're a good girl, you're a good boy, but we are a great guy, you know, sometimes I'm called patriotic and this and that and the other. I said, listen, environmental protection is patriotism in action. And the converse is also true. We can talk of China, we can talk about this, we can talk about that, but if you destroy your own country from inside, what are we protecting the border for? Because we want the inside to be healthy, you know. We need to speak. If you don't speak, you don't deserve to complain. You, I'm again saying, you, you, me, you know. So the one of the reasons we started Sanctuary was to make people fall in love. Now we are running Sanctuary itself. And I, I'd say that many of the NGOs are now shifting focus. I told you the rules have changed. We are shifting focus to the tri-junction between biodiversity, economics, and climate change, which is a spoiler for both biodiversity and economics. India is moments away from an economic collapse of mammoth proportions which nobody has seen even when the British were here because there is no water left in India. The aquifers are, are fallen. I mean, the bottom has dropped out of aquifers. The glaciers don't even exist in some places. It's just rock. The coastal aquifers, you can go into the sea. You should be able to go into the sea and if you put... Uh, a small, you made a bow well, you'd get sweet water coming out where the sea is on top. Those are the aquifers. But we built so many dams that the pressure of sweet water is now not enough to keep the salt water out. So it's starting. So along our coastline, we're going to get salinity. When the Bangladesh war took place, 71 or thereabouts, <clears throat> at that point, India's backbone almost got broken purely because Look at us, we are like Tinder. Look at, the, look at the differences between us. You know, we are so good as people. But rich, poor, north, south, Hindu, Muslim, all these differences that exist, caste system, we learned to live together because over centuries we learned to live together. The more people divide us and the resources get diminished, 
I can put it in uncertain terms that India is a time bomb 10 times larger and more dangerous than Syria because when you have an arterial blockage, you don't put a clamp, you put a stent. We need to allow some of the tension to go, share a little. I think we should end this evening. I'd, I'd like to end it on the advice I got from the Dalai Lama by mistake. We live in India. I didn't know who it was. Security didn't say who I was speaking with, but there was the Dalai Lama sitting on my right and here I was. And in India, the meeting started 20 minutes late. So I'm in awe of and I speak to him and he talks to me about how when China took over Tibet, they took away all the timber, the forests have gone. And all the countries that were saying, how oh, very bad, very bad, China took away all this thing and took Tibet and all that, they were the people buying the timber. So when he said this to me, it wasn't a happy conversation, you know. I said to him, Your Holiness, I must then tell you that I work with the Belinda Wright, the WPSI, and the Horse Festival, they have tiger skins for a long time on their shoulders, but those are fresh tiger skins now. And the bones, they are underneath the orange robes, the Buddhist monks are taking tiger bone and selling it to China. So it was not a very happy conversation, but something touched him. A week later, he went out and he made a statement to say, no horse festival must not have this thing. So when China heard this, they said, you must have this thing, you know. So I'm just saying, when this all this happened, he could see my face falling, you know. And the bell went ting for the meeting to start, and I felt a tap on my shoulder. And he speaks in a beautiful soft voice, not like my rasping voice, you know. He speaks in a beautiful soft voice. He says, remember my son, it is your duty to be happy every day of your life. He never said you should be happy. He said you are given the gift of life. Then. I was a bit, you know, I mean, talking about all this, then he said, see, when plane goes down, mask falls, they say, put on, put on yourself, then put on baby. You love baby less? No. If you are not happy, you, if you are not okay, you won't be able to do anything for somebody else. If you can eat and you don't have food, don't be guilty. Give a little food. And that's the solution for the whole world. Actually, for each one of us, we don't have to think too much, you know. And the biggest problem, according to me, the biggest problem, Rita, the biggest problem is everybody is waiting for somebody else to do something. And that is really the shackle that you have to break, even if it's writing a letter to the editor, even if it's writing to Theodore Bhaskaran and saying, look, thank you for translating this and making this happen, and thank you for doing this, or some forest guard somewhere, or even the chief minister if he does something, or the prime minister if he does something good. Write, speak, be heard, you're in a democracy. Your voice matters. Editors, journalists, television. I have not watched television now for at least about three months. And I'm a happier man for that, you know. So, and yet I, I'd say the medium of film is very important. And I think I have far overstepped my time limits for this. Sunil said it's 45 minutes after that you go. I think it, I'm sorry. Will you still give me a single malt when we go home? Yeah. <laughs> didn't want to make it too soft on you for the conversation, so I thought I'd ask one hard question. Ask a hard question. <laughs> I like those. So, I think and when she was saying, you know, people who speak non-English speaking people are more aware, I think, to some, not special to your point, but I think in general we, in this country at least, we've been romanticizing, you know, uh, native knowledge quite a bit because those people, when I actually interact with them in the rural areas, they want the urban life, right? What's happening today in the country, what I'm seeing up close and personal is conservationists are being pitted against the tribals through the yeah. FRA conversation. Yeah. So when you mentioned we need to give back to the communities, there are, there are huge budgetary allocations for giving back to the communities. There are people making things for the communities. But it seems to me that the FRA is coming in pretty now where NGOs, wildlife NGOs don't want to talk to each other because, because of FRA. Right. FRA is the Forest Rights Forest Act, Forest Rights Act yeah. um, where there is a slightly atrocious act which is giving away quite a bit of land back to uh, tribals but from forest areas. It's, it's good to give people the landless land for sure but where does it come from? It's coming at the cost of many of our protected areas. So 
if you look so at Vita, I have a solution and a response to that. I think yeah. the solution is very clear. First, I mean, I have to accept that when we created Project Tiger in the 70s and 80s, we abused human rights. We used elephants too. When I say we, I was just, I, I was only looking at this. I'm just assuming the blame because I supported Project Tiger at that point and it came back. Um, I feel now the solution lies in something that we at Sanctuary have, have done and we spoke to Vijay Mohan Raj who we are going to meet and he said that's exactly what we are planning to do. So if you take, in India, we don't always buy our dahi in packets. So jamun to make dahi. Our existing protected area network is so small, it's only jamun. You can't make lassi out of jamun now. So that is something that the human rights people have to understand. And wildlife people have to understand that we have no right to ask them to consume less. They have already, their nutrition is bad, they, they have no hospitals, they have nothing. And on top of that, we are putting pollution into their lives because we put this brown haze all over. I would say that the answer there lies that when you find, let's say, uh, let me take the example of Taroba or Ranthambore or even Nagarhole, when the protection has caused animals to have enough food and water and they multiply, then they go outside and they hammer the fields of those people. Maybe using CAMPA funds or something, we would go to them and say that, listen, they are not exactly happy. We got TISS, the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, we got them to interview to do a survey, we say, I said, we are not even going to give you the questions. You go out and do it. Do they want to continue agriculture? Or are they happy to live their lives with an alternate of their choice? 93% of the people out of a thousand families came back saying, we want the hell out of agriculture next to this because you're, it's, everybody thinks it's the wild boar and the, and the deer and the monkeys. It's the grasshoppers. They are eating their crop. So, and then the, all night long they've got to sit over there and do this. Children are not going to schools. So we said, we called it cocoon conservancies, community-owned, community-operated nature conservancy. So like a fried egg, if you would say that our PAs are the yellow, then the, surrounding this, the buffer zones which are now protected, I said the income from tourism should go to those people who live on the outside, it's something that we are already trying to do. We have done successfully. We have got biological proof of concept. We have got social proof of concept. At one of the meetings that we held in Maharashtra, after about a year and a half of, of having 105 acres of land uh, rewilded without our pulling out one weed or planting one tree, it came back at this moment in time, there's a tigress with four or five cubs sitting over there using it once, once or twice a week. Now, there was a huge uproar outside our meeting when we went to the Gram Sabha, uh, the, the Gram Panchayat meeting. And I said, Ab to gaya. He said, something has gone wrong. So when I went out and spoke to him, I said, what do you think of these people? Is he your son-in-law? Why are you only giving it to these 105? You've got 350 acres more. Let us be part of this. That was the social proof of concept. They did not want to do agriculture there. Uh, and they are not adding to the food security. Most of them, they are doing marginal agriculture and marginal farming. And India has got the dubious distinction of being the farmer suicide capital of the world. Look at Maharashtra. It's Vidarbha. It's horrible. So what we are saying is not that we want to tell them to do this. We want to give them an option. If they want to do this, they can do this. They can, they can be the people who... Sunil Chanani wants to go in or Rita Bose wants to go over there, then you pay the, the barrier, let them have it, go inside, you'll see the tigress, you'll see this, you'll have birders, you'll, you know, that's, that's the only way I can think of solving that problem, a long answer, but it's a, it's a vital question and I think the people who live closest to biodiversity should be the first beneficiaries of that biodiversity and we need to make reparations for what we did wrong in 73. Nature worked. Nature doesn't care, give you, it doesn't give you, as I said, doesn't give you any judgments. You're a good guy, you're a bad guy. It only gives you warnings, then consequences. So if we can understand that sharing, like the Dalai Lama said, share some of your food, well, share some of your wealth with them. Part of this, let their children be their children. The younger generation doesn't necessarily want to keep 
moving wild pigs away from their farm. And at least for a month in a year, they, they, they get food for work. That's not food security. Food security is bringing the sponge back, bringing the aquifers. And I'll end with what I tell children, 12 years old. I say that, look, you can't save the tiger if you don't save the forest. I keep telling them that the tiger is a metaphor. When you save the forest and the rainfall that falls on the top canopy, goes to the middle canopy, goes to the lower canopy, then it doesn't fall on the soil. All the leaves that fell, it falls on the leaf. That's how delicate the soil is. From there it soaks in, it goes into the aquifer. Then it stops raining four months later. And that aquifer feeds the underground rivers. And I talk to them about that horrible thing that happened in Thailand with, with the football team that got washed away. And I said, there are rivers underneath you. Those rivers need to be full. They are the ones that will eventually feed our, our wells. The wells will feed the farms. And the sterility of the soils that we have created by using chemical fertilizers and chemical pesticides, it won't take more than three seasons to bring that fertility back. And in five years' time, it will grow again. And that is the direction. I, I predict the death of chemical farming. I predict that India's, the people who are heroes today, everybody wants to be an investment banker. I'm telling you something, that they will be ashamed of what they are doing if they are pushing the climate crises higher. The carbon cowboys, the guys who have turned sources of life into resources of commerce, they will not be painted as heroes tomorrow. The essays that will be written by our children 10 years from today will be, they did this. The way we talk about Jallianwala Bagh and this and that and the other, we are killing people. But there should be no anger expressed. The moment I say, Sunil, you nasty, horrible man, this is what you did, the first thing you do is defense and deny what I'm saying. Let us learn to live together. This opposition of environment or development is false opposition and we must learn to live together and thank you very much thank you very 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 much